because molecules are small graphs. When you think about it, Shoot. look at Google, Netflix, Amazon, all of these big Web2 companies, all of them use knowledge graphs under the hood. Origin trail. Exactly. The launch team wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Hey everybody, and thank you for watching the Space Monkeys podcast. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, this episode is going to be just the same as ever. If you're watching the video, however, you'll notice that partway through the show, the camera feed on me, and then unfortunately, later in the episode on our guests, cuts out. This was due to the extreme Bangkok heat shutting down the cameras we use, and by the time we noticed, we had already had such a grooving conversation about AI and Origin Trail's role in its productive future that we thought it would be a little rude to re-record and fake it for you. So Didi from the Coos team came through with an animation to fill in the blanks. Thanks very much for watching. Enjoy. Space Monkeys blasting off with the guys from Origin Trail and NeuroWeb about decentralized knowledge graphs and the future of AI, hopefully a positive future of AI. We have Brana Rakic, we have Brana Rak... Now I'm overdoing it. <laughs> Brana Rakic. You have to leave this in, man. <laughs> we have... We have Brana Rakic here and Nikola Todorovic. Very lucky to have them on the show here. We're gonna dive deep into this protocol that's been around for a while, already made a splash, and now making an important foray into AI. Guys, welcome to the show and thanks for being here. Thanks for having us, man. Thank very, you. very good. So we're gonna get into AI, which is obviously the hot thing right now. We're gonna talk about AI, solving AI hallucinations, intellectual property issues. What do you call it when the, it kind of destroys itself with bullshit, like model- Model collapse. Model collapse, yeah, we're gonna get into that. Nice. First, can you guys uh, just give us a few words about the position, the role you play in the Origin Trail ecosystem today? So yeah, my position is officially a uh, lead blockchain engineer. Okay. So yeah, fully focused on the narrow web, making the, those transactions go into the block. And aside of that, yeah, uh, a lot of involvement in the DKG protocol specification and implementational parts. So yeah, and two layers on the layer one on the narrow web and on the layer two on the DKG. So Crazy. Bouncing between the layers. Have you been with the project for a while? Yeah, three and a half years. So okay. Like All right. Good stuff. Brana, how about you? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, one of the founders and CTO behind the project. Uh, been here for over 10 years. Wow. Um, and yeah, like pretty much doing everything <laughs> that I can to evangelize the technology, sure. help the guys build the best they can, um, and yeah, just bring it to the world. So really getting the technology adopted. When you say you've been here for 10 years, you're talking about not Origin Trail for 10 years. Yes, absolutely, Origin Trail. Um, so tell us a little bit about the foundation of Origin Trail. What was the idea? What problem yeah. were you trying to solve? Back when Origin Trail started, which was 2013, Yeah, we didn't do... Uh, what we're doing exactly the way we're doing it today, huh. but we were tackling the same problem. And it was always a problem of accessing verifiable knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, we started actually with centralized closed source uh, applications back then that would help companies show the provenance of their products. That was specifically meat and dairy products at the beginning. They okay. were the first adopters. Yeah, yeah. And then soon, very soon after we realized that um, you know, we wanted to cover bigger systems, bigger uh, supply chains, industry 4.0. Very quickly, you run into this problem that uh, essentially you're not able to do it with a closed source proprietary system, okay. centralized system, mm. because you get into data governance issues, like, you know, companies, that, like not everybody wants to put data in one place. Which place is that? Like, sure. is that like, you know, one company database or one country database, you know? Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start growing beyond the small supply chain, this is a problem. Hmm. And we realized that essentially decentralization is the way to go. Yeah. So around 2016, we started uh, building this decentralized knowledge graph. So taking from this centralized notion to decentralized, um, which is a multi-chain or at the time we called it blockchain agnostic decentralized knowledge graph. So started on Ethereum 2018, Yeah. Uh, launched the project successfully and then expanded into other chains and then since uh, a couple of years ago, actually uh, launched the custom um, built pair chain, the NeuroWeb, yeah. uh, on Polkadot, and it's been it's been a really good journey, and the journey I have to say driven by by adoption. 
Okay. Which maybe is a little bit uh, unusual uh, generally for the Web3 space. Kind because, of refreshing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a very innovative space and yeah, uh, yeah. it's really, really great. Um, mm -hmm. But like what I said, with the way like the, our DNA and the way we started was like we, we started from the product. So from the position of solving problems for existing users and actually getting paid for that. Yeah, right. So, um, so there's um, today there's a lot of enterprises and a lot of different uh, companies in quite a bit of industry 4.0 use cases using Origin Trail in production also meaning using Polkadot, essentially. Let's zoom in on that first use case, just to use it as an example. You said meat and dairy, right? Yeah. What was the problem in meat and dairy that they needed solving? When you look at supply chains, kind of the holy grail there was forever, like to know end to end what's going on, like get right. the sense and transparency. Because this helps with- um, All kinds of things. Impro like improving efficiencies, efficiencies and exactly. preventing theft and spoilage. And, exactly, and, yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and But also in the end, informing the cost, because we got all these bold claims, organic this, certified that right 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 and that's very easy to say yes um and uh, it comes down to you know who screams louder in the marketing sense oh okay and it very few companies uh, were actually willing from at the beginning to, to show like okay uh, what what does this actually look like in mm, practice mm. so the technology of origin trail enabled the good guys the really good companies to show aha this is the provenance of not just our products but also the information sure so for example today you can go into retail stores in Europe, scan a code, um, mm. a QR code basically on a piece of meat, mm -hmm. chicken, a beef, in, um, and see, and basically chat with the meat uh, using an AI interface through Origin Trail, um, but actually not generating an answer by AI, rather querying the decentralized knowledge graph, sure. getting all of the information from the entire chain of, uh, of um, the supply chain for that product. Wow. And essentially you can know which, you know, is it organic, um, you know, where, which farm it came from, uh, who, who audited this, all, but also other knowledge about it, like recipes, things like that. Uh, you can interact with the brand. And there's just one use case, like for example, another use case where the origin trail is heavily used is uh, with retailers. So retailers in the US, uh, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, actually cover 40% of US imports Insane. With uh, exchanging security audits. Yeah. That is facilitated also together with um, uh, what is called the Supplier Compliance Audit Network or SCAN, together with British Standards Institution. And what they do is this, essentially they exchange security audits. What are these security code. audits? So a security audit is whenever a big company like Walmart needs to import something into the US, yeah. usually from China, because uh -huh. that's where a lot of the, the products are sourced from. They need to provide a certain set of documents to, to show like, okay, this is coming from an actual proper factory without child labor, without okay. any Okay, yeah, they have all involved. these certificates, yeah. Both Walmart has to do it and Home Depot has to do it and everybody has to do it. Um, so these guys actually realize that even though they're competitors in the market, they should not compete on security. So mm. if I as Walmart have uh, an audit that I've done on your factory, mm. I can share it with him who is from Home Depot anonymously yeah. through okay. Uh, the DKG, oh. and we can both benefit from essentially, you know, sharing this capacity rather than like overloading this factory with what is called audit fatigue. Yeah. But also just spending more. Why would we all spend like you know for the same thing? You, you um, know, I I feel there's a lot of parallels between what you guys are doing and a lot of the architectures around decentralized identities, right? It's absolutely. like really this attester yes. and, you know, it's a trustless system, but it's about a trusted entity um, making a claim. Exactly. Right, that other exactly. people uh, believe through reputation. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so identity is a huge part of it. Mm. And um, the way we've designed Origin Trail is that it can seamlessly integrate with identity systems that follow sure. certain standards. Sure, sure. Either ERC standards or existing W3C standards mm -hmm. or GS1 standards, which are these industry 4.0 standards. For example, a barcode is an identifier by GS1 that exists for 50, 50 years already. Right, right. Essentially, that was always the idea. Not that obviously we build everything, but rather we enable everybody to, to plug their solution in. It's beautiful. So these um, trusted pieces of knowledge, I think I've heard you call them knowledge assets. Yes. And they're minted by paying, mm -hmm. do you call it trace or track? Uh, both. Both, yeah. I guess community okay. calls it track. Uh, it track, so yeah. Maybe we should use track. Okay, <laughs> fine. So <laughs> you, do you burn the track token or you pay the track token? How, how does that work? How does, what's the tokenomics say? You don't burn the trade token, you just pay someone. So you, you make an agreement. For example, you as an old runner, you want to store data. And I as a publisher, someone who needs 
some trusted yeah. uh, trust database, trust yeah. thing to store my knowledge, it will go and say, okay, I'm ready to pay this amount of money for this time periods for someone to store the data. And yeah, then we just close an agreement, which will be stored on chain. And over the time, you will need to send some proofs to, to show that you actually still hold the data and the wow. tokens will get unlocked and will you get into your account. So there's no inflation. It's yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the hardware behind these nodes? What does it take to run a node? Well, I would say it's quite lightweight to run oh, a DKG yeah. node. Beautiful. So yeah, something that's used, I guess, by community is that four gigs of RAM, yeah, simple CPU with two cores, so something quite easier. Okay. It can, like, it depends on how much data you want to store and how much performance you not want to go. So it can go below that. It will be work fine. Sure. Closely, and it will be able to run into browser also. So that's also lights the you know that we are looking so there are small like examples that we have also where you can like from the browser go and publish and then we'll have like a full node into browser also. And this data is very lightweight, like it's not videos or anything like that. So essentially, yeah, it's it's this knowledge web format. Yeah. Which is this um a very, very adopted web two adopted way. So I would even say Web2 perfected way mm. of co connecting knowledge and data from different points. And kind of, maybe it makes sense to make this distinction of data and knowledge. Okay, let's uh, do it, Because yeah. data is, in a way, it's kind of like, you can consider it's kind of a raw form. Mm. It's like, um, you know, comes in different formats. Um, it can be clean, doesn't have to be clean. Like, there's a lot of different types of data you can sure, think of. Sure, sure. And knowledge is kind of a, next order in terms of hierarchy uh, uh, above yeah, yeah where actually knowledge creates kind of a, a connected contextualized data yeah. with certain types oh. so when when the knowledge graph term was invented it was actually invented by google 2012 they describe it as things and not strings so strings meaning like these textual strings of characters, which we use in data sense. Sure, sure. Uh, well, a knowledge graph understands that something is a thing. So for example, if you go to Google today, yeah. and in Google search you type in, let's say, Albert Einstein, yeah. the Google search engine will understand that actually you're looking for a thing called Albert Einstein, which is a person mm. which has a, you know, a date of birth, which has a place of uh, you know where, where they invented this and that. and who they were married to and whatnot, mm. because it understands the concept of a human and, and like versus just a bunch of text. This so, makes sense to me. It's like the uh, assigning meaning to just exactly. random information, really, exactly. right? Th this comes from actually a very interesting notion like way back uh, when Tim Berners-Lee designed the World Wide Web. Yeah. He actually also designed another type of World Wide Web, the kind of back then, then they called it Web 3.0 before we had our own Web3 thing, oh. um, which was this called notion of semantic web, this this meaning, the web of meaning. Mm. Um, and some people would argue that it didn't like achieve the vision, but actually I would say it did. It did, but in a very centralized way. So today, if you look at Google, Netflix, Amazon, pretty much all of literally any big Uber, all of these big Web2 companies, all of them use knowledge graphs under the hood. Okay. And what do they do out of, uh, out of it? Well, they're basically extracting a ton of value. Out of it. So, you know, it's used all, all, all of the time under the hood. Whenever Netflix recommends your show to watch, whenever Amazon uh, tries to upsell you something with another recommendation, mm. all of that comes from knowledge graph. Okay. And, and essentially what they do, they turn that data into money because they get to sell more. Sure. They get to keep engaged more. Mm. You know, Google gives you better searches, so you're you're like they can sell you ads. Um, so this proven technology, which actually has a lot of uh, standards behind it, a lot of technology developed, yeah, is what we are bringing to Web three. Love so it. So we didn't invent like a whole new thing. Got uh, it. Yeah. We we basically said, okay, let's build a decentralized version of that, and let's bring it to the people, so anybody can use. Okay, let's stick with the knowledge graph section just for a moment. Can you describe a little bit the structure of a knowledge graph, why it works? So when you think of a knowledge graph, you can think of like these entities, these objects, like I mentioned, connected together. And the good thing about it is compared to, let's say, kind of a traditional database um, or even a blockchain, which you can kind of consider kind of like a special case of a database, hmm. you don't need a strict structure 
meaning certain table with certain columns or a certain type of transaction, uh, but rather you can define the concept of a person or the concept of a factory or, or a place or uh, a program, agent, whatever. And then you can connect these things together. Yeah. Um, and the more context you give it, the more definition you give it, Yeah. the more symbolically you represent this. This is actually, by the way, a branch of AI called symbolic AI. Knowledge graphs are AI technology. Okay. The more a machine can understand it. So this is this older branch of AI where you could essentially apply logical rules, mm -hmm. such as uh, deduction logic. For example, you can, a um, very trivial, naive example would be, for example, family relations. Hmm. Let's say, um, I don't know, my father's name is Tom. So it says Tom is father of Brana. And uh, let's say I have a son and his name is Jake. And so Brana is father of Jake. These are two, what they call triples in the graph, okay. which have entities and some relations. So two persons and some relation in between. Yeah. And it happens to be that this father and son in the middle the same person yeah then we as humans naturally understand how huh, this first one is the grandfather yeah, right yeah so or cool. i see so essentially uh if you put this just like in a file or some classic database yeah without this inference logic or this logic embedded somewhere mm. the computer won't understand aha uh -huh, okay this is actually gr grandfather which is new information that wasn't there before but if you encode this in a knowledge graph which has something called an ontology uh, which can understand how family relationships or people relationships, friend of a friend, that's actually the name of an ontology, friend of a friend, Okay, okay. Uh, used in social social networks. Well, it basically can create new knowledge. It can deduce it, but it doesn't deduce it like an LLM does, hallucinating, or, you know. Guessing. But rather it, it uses uh, logic, you know, to, to essentially deduce um, or induce rather um, new information. Wow. And this is just the most trivial example. Um, the most advanced examples that are happening today, this neuro-symbolic AI um, is, for example, drug discovery, because molecules are small graphs when you think about it. So they take like medicines, which are molecules, and they know this works on that and this works. So most likely because of this graph structure, this might work for cancer. This might work for whatever, you know, and, wow. and this is what they're actually doing uh, quite a bit with, with uh, graph machine learning. Section. Beautiful. So the decentralized part of this, is it simply instead of being in a single database owned by a few people, the um, data is spread out or replicated across a, a larger network of machines? Is that it? Exactly. And okay. anybody can run a, a node of the DKG. So you could run one, for example. Are people running full nodes only? or So you can run a full node, meaning your hosting graph, or yeah. you can run a gateway node, which okay. enables you to access it. Kind of like an oh, RPC node. Okay, yeah. So you can run it, and, and it's very lightweight, like Nikola said, and you can then do queries on the graph. You can download contents of the graph, and mm -hmm. you can download a specific portion of the graph, yeah. or what, uh, what actually is uh, kind of the new... Um, innovation in DKG called Paranets. So you could say, I'm interested in this particular Paranet and I want to gather all the knowledge from there and do build AI applications on top, essentially. So Nikolai, I saw you made a thread about the most recent white paper. We covered the white paper yeah. too on the show. Um, super fascinating. In that white paper, you guys defined a lot of potential issues for corruption and uh, degradation of AI systems. Can, can you give us a little bit of a, a rundown on some of the issues yeah. facing AIs today? Well, yeah, I would start yeah, from the AI hallucinations, which are yeah. the most common thing. And yeah, the AI is always hallucinating. It's yeah. just very good at it. And it's <laughs> the issue is when it's hallucinating wrong stuff, when it's making wrong assumptions and give us something not based on, on, on true facts. Sure. And that's one of the things that needs to be tackled. Then besides that, which is right now most common and we see it, then there is like the old problem from previous study. The ownership, the intellectual property, who is owning the data, on which data it's built, like what's used for to train those AI models. Sure. Intellectual so, property, yeah. Yeah, that's one part. And then something that's upcoming and that's maybe not so seen is the model collapse. Yeah, so is, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, more and more, like right now, the data through the AI is mostly generated by us, by humans. Okay. But in future, we'll see more and more data generated by the AI, other AI models, mm. which is called synthetic data. Mm. And when you plug in back those data into AI models, they, they start to degrade over time. They, yeah. they, they become less and less efficient. They hallucinate more and they, they just will collapse. Like, they hit the plateau and there's no more advanced of AI. And yeah. that's something that cannot be like easily avoided. And that plus 
okay, the bias part is something that is part of hallucination where they are, depending on the data use, they will be biased in a way mm -hmm. as late. And those are like the four, four main problems that should be tackled in the AI field to have like reliable data that can like advance, like in the interest of humanity, like in proper ways. So just to repeat that, so AI hallucinations, bias, uh, data ownership, and model collapse. And you guys believe that the single source of all these problems could be uh, just low quality data, low quality information that the AI is training on? In the future, yes, because okay. it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to generate junk, essentially. I see, yeah. Uh, because now we can like generate data at scale like very easily. The um, synthetic data. Synthetic data. Yeah. Um, and But not just that, like AI is going to be creating like maybe plausible, okay, synthetic data, but it still deteriorates its performance. Mm. What we uh, think the key elements of kind of the solution for what we call a verifiable internet mm. um, are some basic elements. One you mentioned already, which is identity. So having a, uh, a way to implement decentralized identity to identify sources of information. Sure. Then... Um, trusted sources. Trusted sources. Yeah. But like, who determines what are trusted sources? Uh, Nobody should determine for you. Right. You should determine yourself. So think of having the ability, providing everybody any source in the world mm. who is identifiable to publish knowledge into one big knowledge base yeah. together. And then you, as the consumer, the knowledge consumer, have the ability to determine, okay, I'm going to filter this out because I'm not going to you know, listen to, I don't know, Nikola, for example, because I, I don't like his whatever ideology or bias sure, or whatever, sure, I'm yeah. going to pick my bias. <laughs> okay, but yeah. um, <laughs> one key point here is that like each input, in each data point or rather knowledge asset coming into this system should um, have a known issuer. So we, we should know who, who that is, what identity that is. Uh -huh. And we should have some form of verifiability for that data. For example, basic form is, I know that Nicola published something at a certain piece of uh, moment in time, and I can verify that it was published exactly in that way. This is actually built uh, into Origin Trail according to a, a, another W3C standard called Verifiable Credentials. Oh yeah. So essentially the point here being is like you made an assertion or an attestation and uh, at this point in time, is this att attestation true? Well, technology cannot say hmm. because it's very hard. There's no algorithm that says, you know, we input something in and it says true or false right now, or, or at least we can do that for some basic or very, let's say, um, abstract things like math, for example. Okay, okay. But like for real world events, it's, mm. it's very hard to, to say. Sure. But what we can apply is we can build a connected database of information of different claims from different sources, and then we can make some sense out of it. Or we can sure. see what connects, what fits together. Oh. Does this statement counteract other statements? Yeah. You know, um, and essentially the key primitives here being discoverability. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to find something that was said about something or uh, some information about a certain object. Um, ownership. I want to be able to own a piece of information that I've created. And then verifiability, obviously, that you know you can see who the source is, yeah. that information. And if it hasn't been tempered with or a certain piece of information is contained in that particular you knowledge asset. So those are the three key... The claim is that those are the three key primitives that you have to build up on top. But that doesn't solve everything, obviously. No, of course, of course. It kind of gets into this other area of Web3 that we hear about, which is oracles, right? Off-chain attesters mm -hmm. or attesters of off-chain events or data. It's similar. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a typical oracle you would use in a sense of providing off-chain data to on-chain systems, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the Oracle would essentially have some sort of trust model, like, for example, consensus between multiple nodes or something. Yeah. So the, you could, let's say, say, up until this threshold, this many nodes should should basically agree on a certain value. Sure. It's from when I will trust. But in a similar way, when you think about it, if there's a lot of claims connected in a graph, and they might not necessarily need to be used on chain. They can be used off chain as well. Uh, for example, you querying, you're asking about something um, using AI, um, yeah. and then um, actually the AI not generating the answer for you, but rather extracting it from the pool of this knowledge, discovering this knowledge, and then connecting and showing to you. Mm -hmm. um, 
then you off chain can decide what trust means to you. Just as you can say, I don't know, five nodes are enough for an Oracle to submit this value to contract and I'll trust it. Yeah, I get it. You can say, okay, five people from the Polkadot community is enough for me. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and not from this other community because I don't like them. <laughs> or something like that. Okay, beautiful. So you guys are also multi-chain, right? You guys started on yeah. Ethereum. You're on Gnosis yes. as well. Yes. And besides uh, your Polkadot parachain, anywhere else? Yeah, so uh, Origin 12 version 5 is also Polygon. Oh, yeah. But essentially the idea is that you have the an open system that any blockchain can adopt. It's so cool. So the idea is that um, you can essentially, this, in a way, kind of drive the community to adopt uh, the DKG on your chain if... Um, but it's the same DKG. Sense. It's the same DKG, yeah. It's so cool. It's the same network and essentially uh, what is uh, what what the DKG does is it enables you to create these knowledge assets which actually mint these NFTs on chain uh, that are ownership records and obviously um, contain certain uh, cryptographic proofs inside yeah. of them on the knowledge and the knowledge is inside of the DKG. So hmm. you can connect knowledge from different chains in the same, the same graph. Interesting. If you have a chain that's you know, a little bit more centralized or a little bit more at risk of being censored or taken down somewhere in the future. Mm -hmm. Would this like create like a hole in the DKG or is this a risk that you consider? That's a good question. Um, I would say no. Okay. Because uh, two reasons. One reason is, and it's again, back to our principles we go by with development. One, one of them being neutrality, the other one being inclusiveness. Yeah. Meaning, who are we to say that a chain is more centralized or not? Yeah, it's tough. Sometimes, you know, okay, some things are maybe obvious, but um, on the other hand, if people want to use something, if there's a community building uh, and using certain pieces of technology, we don't want to say like, no, you're not like part of this, Good. this, this story. Yeah. Uh -huh. like if, if it brings value and it drives innovation, um, it, it should have the opportunity to use the technology that, that uh, you know, we're just kind of driving development of. Mm. Um, but I, I think also another point here being is, uh, again, back to the principle of um, discoverability. So when you use the knowledge from the DKG or an AI uses knowledge from the DKG, it, uh, it can always decide which sources it trusts or not. And yeah, yeah. one of the cases could be, okay, I don't like this chain, this mm. community, sure. filter this out, you know, and that's, that's fine. So That's if you consider it the whole, it's up to you. you know. Origin trail. Exactly. Wow. Origin of information and trail <laughs> of, of provenance. Yeah. It's beautiful. So um, let's talk about the move to Polkadot. You guys uh, moved up. What was it? Two years ago already? Yeah. You guys launched a crowd loan, uh, which also brought about a new token. Uh, the oh, At the time, it was OTP. OTP, yeah. Origin Trail Parachain Token. Yeah. What was the reason to come to Polkadot? Was it this move of inclusivity? and? It's, it's also uh, the sheer flexibility mm. of building custom things. So at the time, Origin Trail Parachain and today, NeuroWeb, like, is basically an innovation hub for decentralized AI. Okay. Where the idea is that there are built-in incentives from this community of NeuroWeb to anybody who wants to build decentralized AI systems on top of DKG. Mm. So essentially incentivizing the growth of the knowledge and the systems within that space um, for the benefit of everybody versus the Web2 where everybody's like building their own centralized knowledge graphs and extracting yeah. value from our data. Yeah. Um, the idea here is to go like the other way. And, uh, and as any um, proper Web3 project, um, Neuro is there to provide the incentive for that but also an environment where we can innovate. So innovate in, on the substrate level, for example, building in new things that are you can just not build in a kind of a Solidity smart contract mm -hmm. on an EVM chain. So um, so these were just some of the key key points with, which, which brought us to Polkadot. And uh, we're big believers in the technology. The yeah. Polkadot, I, I would say, I mean, uh, it's, it's very much aligned with, with our ethos. So both in terms of uh, the way um, software development is done, but also in terms of the way technology is being built and, and we're happy to, to have a chain within this community. We're very, very happy to have you in the community <laughs> and under the security umbrella with us. One of the surprising things about your chain, I mean, even before the change to NeuroWeb is like the massive transaction volume. Last month, 2.74 million transactions or extrinsics, mm -hmm. uh, usually in the top three of the whole Polkadot network. Uh, what are these extrinsics? What are these transactions and That's why are there so question. many? So, so as, as we already talked about, the, the project has actually been a while, uh, around for a while. Yeah. And has actually a lot of adoption. So 
uh, Origin Trail has been adopted by, like I mentioned, uh, U.S. retailers. For example, a big user is Swiss Railway Company. Yep. A lot of um, Industry 4.0 use cases, uh, but not just that. There's like uh, you know, there's like restaurants using it. There's like a bunch of different uh, enterprises, and a lot of these transactions pretty much come from them. So whenever they uh, create knowledge assets, and oftentimes these are private knowledge assets, which is also a feature of the DKG, um, enabling data privacy. So not all knowledge needs to be public. Sure. Um, then a lot of these transactions come from that, actually. Okay. These are entries into the graph, and yeah. then the, the companies exchange this knowledge in between each other. And they're paying track tokens to do that. Yes. Even on the parachain, even on the polka dot. Exactly. Network. So Whoa. so there's there's essentially two layers to the system. Decentralized knowledge graph, which has its own utility, this knowledge graph utility. Yeah. And then there's the blockchain layer sure. where blockchains have their own utility. So for, as any other blockchain, you need to use a gas token for a blockchain. Mm -hmm. If you use it on Ethereum or Gnosis, for example, you use XDAI for mm -hmm. Gnosis. If you use it on NeuroWeb, you use the Neuro token as, as the fee, the mm -hmm. basically gas token yeah yeah but on all of them you use uh, the dkg they, they use the utility token of the dkg which is the track token wow so essentially there's two tokens in place since the beginning and come on you, you dropped a little right, juice man. there tell me about private uh, knowledge assets how are you achieving that yeah that's that's actually a really cool property of the knowledge graph yeah? so you can connect essentially public and private yeah. knowledge in one knowledge asset um and it's it's a really good feature because it allows you to put essentially metadata or even more data in the public crowd, public part of knowledge asset mm. while remaining sensitive data in a private knowledge asset. And that means companies that do this, that they need, whoever needs private knowledge, they would run their own node. Oh. So host it uh, on, on uh, ideally their um, cloud, and they would then essentially enable access to this, uh, to the outside world. Uh, essentially enabling access control only to who they want for the private knowledge. I see. Okay. So the private knowledge doesn't get replicated. The public knowledge. Not gets all full nodes are the same. Think of it like uh, like this. Kind of like when you have a website um, that has a paywall. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still has some public information, right? Mm -hmm. For example, New York Times or something. <laughs> Google comes and indexes New York Times public information, right? Because yeah. it doesn't have access to paywall information. I see. And this is beneficial for New York Times because it increases the discoverability of all of their articles. Because when I type something into Google, New York Times shows up in the top or yeah. whatever. <clears throat> but then when I go there, I actually get asked to, I get paid to access the entire article or whatever. I know it's not the most popular thing, but as an example, you can think of it an analogous to, to what enterprise data often does. So sure. for example, in supply chains, we, we see use cases where companies flag a lot of events that happen in supply chains. This moved here. That right. was transformed into this. Yeah. But they don't say exactly what happened publicly. Uh, they say there's an event that happened in yeah. this location. This is the ID. You want to ask me? Ask me. And that's an extrinsic. And that's right an, there. So basically, when they, whenever a new event is created, yeah. uh, published, that will be an extrinsic. Yeah. So cool. Okay. So Neuro now with this white paper 3.0 kind of has some new utility. This is to set up these paranets. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about? what these paranets are and why. Is this another layer on top of the DKG? Yeah, yeah it's not a layer. We can, it's an abstract way we can look at it. It's above, but it's a collection of knowledge assets. Okay. Together with the AI services that are built, or knowledge services that are built on top of it. Mm. So, yeah. What we, so we have a lot of private data created by all those enterprises that we have. But we want to drive more of a public knowledge creation. We want okay. to activate all the communities and create a big shared knowledge there. So idea is for the narrow to be the driver for of it. So narrow as a blockchain will incentivize all the people to join and create public knowledge and populate into the DKG. So it will incentivize knowledge creation or the knowledge mining as we have, and also through the different processes of signaling data and, and marking it, it will uh, share uh, incentives also people to create connections between because the more the data is powerful, the more the more that is connected, the more it's powerful. Idea for narrow web is to be the driver of this crowdsourced knowledge. And that's so, the thing that the paranets provide kind of a beautiful kind of a framework for, let's say, different knowledge to easily work together. Okay. There's different kinds of knowledge, and um, 
like for example, knowledge on sports is different than chemistry and uh, DAOs is completely third third thing, right? So it's like um, a niche of the knowledge graph. Yeah, right? think, yeah. think of it as kind of like a, a selection of, like Nicola said, knowledge assets yeah. and services that are related to a certain topic. Yes. Um, and anybody can start a knowledge planet. So okay. for example, uh, Polkadot general community or specific DAO can start their own paranet and say, okay, this is the knowledge we find that valuable. We're asking everybody to crowdsource, to, to contribute knowledge to it. Mm -hmm. These will be the quality checks. This is the ontology or the format that we want this knowledge into. Ooh, okay. Essentially enabling crowdsourcing of this knowledge together. And is it so that neuro holders can vote together to mint neuro tokens to use as incentives? For a specific paranet, is that how it works? Similar to that. Okay. So, so the tokens are the tokenomics has been designed in such a way that over twenty percent of the entire mission of Neuro is uh, dedicated to incentives. Okay. And it's actually so essentially it's being minted um, by the chain as, yeah. as time uh, goes by. So there's a regular inflation. Yeah, that's a regular mean. inflation. Yeah. Uh, which is also kept, of course, but like it's over the many years, uh, yeah. like decades, actually, the inflation is going to um, to fill up this pool. Is well, there a max supply? Yeah, the max supply is 1 billion neural tokens. Cool. Yeah. And uh, essentially, it's um, up to the community. So if you want to build a paranet and you're looking for incentives, you would be proposing a governance proposal, asking for neural holders to basically, um, in a way, give you a grant of neural sure. to spend on incentives. Sure. Uh, so, so essentially, anybody can do this. And they, you can do this today. So you can already create a grant proposal, and in a way convince the rural community to help you fund crowdsourcing of this knowledge. Let's say, for example, I want to create a, uh, a paranet about 80s album, like music releases or something like mm -hmm. that. What would I have to do to convince the neuro holding community that this is a good business decision for, for neuro? Essentially, ultimately, each paranet should define what kind of problem it solves and right. where's the opportunity there, right? Yeah. So, what can you do with this valuable knowledge? And then essentially, if you're able to convince the neuro community, the neuro community will support you. But essentially, the community likely won't support you if you're just playing around and you're not like, you know, actually solving a real problem. Sure, right? sure. So, uh, but yeah, I think a music paranet would be really awesome. Okay. Um, and then it doesn't have to be just 80s, it can be anything. Sure, sure. Uh, because, like, for example, an opportunity we've been thinking about there uh, as really music fans is that there's such a mess in the music industry hmm. we haven't been like directly involved in it but like it's an extremely centralized place yeah right the artists are really not done right um doing all of the creation and now with the advent of ai like you can see all around the art space like artists are becoming even less relevant like ai is taking over and people are just like misattributing their art not attributing it at all you mm -hmm. know creating new generated art hmm. so as knowledge miners on paranets, what we also want to provide is ability to actually derive art from existing right, properly attributing. So, so not like you know going against AI, rather um, embracing it, but doing it the right way. Mm. And there's a lot of opportunity to build value from knowledge here, because ultimately, when you think about it, why is Spotify valuable? Spotify is valuable not just because they have a bunch of music files. You can, you can get that anywhere. Everybody has them. But it's because actually they have a big knowledge graph under the hood as well, Spotify, to recommend you songs and whatnot. But they, sure. they get to there because, you know, they're, they're the platform for where you can discover music, where you can access the music. Yeah. So um, it's, it's only a matter of time where there will be more and more open platforms where artists of any kind in music will be able to do the same, especially assisted with AI. We don't no longer need like a centralized entity to just curate this for us. Uh, rather, musicians can create their knowledge assets, expose it, and build a paranet, things like that, yeah, musicians, yeah. and then just discover it. And you can go and ask, like my, my really uh, dream is, and I'm sure this will come true very soon, is going in and asking a question like, give me, I don't know, some um, recommend me some music that sounds like uh, I don't know Tivoli Corporation or Massive Attack, but a little bit more techno, or uh -huh. a little bit more summary, or you know, sure, and, then, sure. and then the AI can understand that, create a knowledge graph query, find these random undiscovered artists from some remote place like New Zealand that you never heard of, yeah, yeah, and and you actually get to enjoy something that's perfectly tailored to your taste, and it doesn't have to be Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, so these. 
uh, paranets are really like business nets. The idea, and, and in fact, the whole decentralized knowledge graph is backed by real world business and utility, right? Which yep. is really quite amazing, right? You have the meat and dairy industry actually producing product, get, yep. gaining profit. I think I understand how this would accrue value to the track token. Mm -hmm. How would a successful paranet accrue value to the, the Neuro token? Neuro has multiple utilities, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. Um, not just governance, but also as, like we said, for knowledge mining, Yes, yeah, so the token. incentives. Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah, the incentives. Yeah. Um, and essentially the the driver for Neuro being that if uh, essentially the, there's enough of usage of the network and the, the incentives bring knowledge into the graph, then transactions on all these knowledge, including potential data marketplace oh, okay. transactions. Because um, it's also a transaction token. Exactly. Yeah, They're right. also going to drive essentially utilization of, of the network. Gotcha. Um, and... Um, when you think about it, like under the hood of all of those systems that we mentioned in Web2, it's all either some sort of information retrieval or information capture or publishing mm. a transaction under the hood. Mm. That is where Neuro comes into play to facilitate that, but ultimately kickstarting it with incentives. The ultimate goal is to now emit a significant amount of neuro to yeah. kickstart this process sure. and essentially incentivize various different communities to build their paranets so that all of this value from all of this knowledge actually follows the network effect law, yep. Metcalf's law, as, as uh, Nicola mentioned. Beautiful. So what are some paranets that are already up and going? Yeah, one of the, the things we already mentioned uh, also at the talk today is um, a Polkadot-specific paranet. So Polkabot. Polkabot, yes. Yeah. So Polkabot is a service on top of the Polkadot knowledge assets uh, for which we created a beta, basically, but we're actually asking for uh, the Polkadot, wider Polkadot community to get engaged and earn incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, so get your neuro <laughs> by actually publishing uh, knowledge about your community. And mm. that can be your DAO, that can be your project, that can just be you as a person or an artist or whoever, putting it into, into this paranet. Sure. And because it becomes richer, Polkabot is able to answer more questions yeah. with verifiable sources so it doesn't hallucinate about some random thing. Could you guys help us redo our docs? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, in a way, th this is the the point of Polkabot is to be kind of an education platform yeah. for Polkabot. Okay, yeah. Because, I mean, even though we're big fans of the technology, I don't know if you would agree, but I, I would say that we are one of the most complex ecosystems in Web3. Exactly. It's, it's insane. Especially yeah. when you come into the naming part. Like e ooh, yeah. you know, a new person needs to come in and understand what is core time, core jam, and extrinsics. Like even no. the name. The, yeah, the name I know. Is I like, had to use know, both, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it, it can be confusing. Mm -hmm. you know, it happens to me. Like I'm, I'm, even though like I'm a very technical person, I cannot follow everything that's right. going on uh, yeah. all the time. So um, <laughs> obviously this is a big opportunity for AI to help but not like give you some random weird answer to listen sure. to it. Yeah. Rather, a knowledge base curated by the community can provide the basis for these answers. And I will jump in yeah. with another example. Like right now it's a Polkabot, but the question is what other services can be built and Polkabot community can build a lot of services. And one, like I would say quite interesting use case at this moment would be if we have like all the data uh, regarding governance put into knowledge graph, can come and you can create recommendation based system for example for whom should they vote what are the most impactful open proposals or treasury proposals i should vote or what are the settings or you can just ask like i want to create a proposal to for this thing based on all the previous votes based on all previous things what are the Chances, chances for me to win will i get support this is this a good fit at all for a popular ecosystem sure sure so, there are like it's yeah, recommendation it based system. Like Netflix uses it for the movies. You would use it like for some important decisions. Like what, what to focus on, for example. So there's some sweet neuro f for me to uh, to collect here if I contribute knowledge. Yes, totally. What's preventing me from just yeah, lying? That's a good question, and uh, nothing is preventing you from lying. Right. So the technology cannot prevent you from lying. Of course. Um, yeah right <laughs> exactly so uh so garbage in garbage out like that goes from for chain and whatnot uh, and vicky g as well the the point here being is though that if you do so you do it in a way where everybody knows there was you so mm. knowledge has all of the provenance right sure and it can be seen what what you claim to, to have said so um it's up to 
uh, consumer or the parent operators ah. to establish systems that they think are sensible for a certain knowledge domain yeah. to um, enable the users to somehow either curate this knowledge or rather rank it by relevance. Um, so for example, Google does that ranking when you do search. Or when you do search and it, it tries to give you like the most relevant sites on top and the, the least relevant on somewhere at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. But in a similar way, as a parent operator or parent community running it, uh, you can define what would be this criteria for mm. quality, mm. essentially. And um, one of the ways to do this is knowledge signaling. So think of it as kind of like, you know, you know, when you use ChatGPT, you have that thumbs up, thumbs down yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Like, you can help it. Actually, you're teaching it by giving it like, you know, huh. and it kind of trusts you, trusts you. Well, we as a community, we can do a similar thing with signaling where we can say, hey, this this statement doesn't make sense to me. And you do that as, as Kusamaria and as Nikola and, you know, and, and, and different people. Like I would, when I see you guys said, hey, th this is bullshit. Yeah. I, I'd likely trust you because I know you. So it's essentially trust is rooted in identity. So we go back to that topic. Gotcha. Um, but it's multiple identities connected in a graph. Personally, I never downvote the AI because this Roko's Basilisk thing. Like, I don't want it to like <laughs> target me as a negative entity. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, <laughs> so anyway, who, who are you to downvote me? <laughs> yeah. Petty <Pet> human. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, any other paranets uh, in the works happening now? Uh, we cannot reveal all of the details, but sure. there's things uh, happening in the space of um, sports. Ooh. Uh, so so that's. Uh, that's that's happening. There's sports. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. That's as much as I can reveal at this moment. Sure. Uh, there's that. <laughs> there's uh, obviously Industry 4.0. That's that's happening. Quite a lot of different cases there. Um, yeah. We've been approached with a couple of ideas for uh, also for um, company analytics type of parents from the widest possible uh, sense. Also web tree oriented parents, project oriented parents. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things that, that are being in discussion. Um, sure. And, uh, but yeah, parents are about to go live. So governance proposals can already start, uh, like people can already start sending them. Uh, yeah. But we also encourage everybody with any type of idea to just come in come and out. jump into discord and let's talk, talk this, uh, through together because we want to support ideas and answer all of the questions, like the questions pretty much you asked now. Awesome. Based on the previous music panel, mm. we already have the art where you can see exactly. a bunch of paintings and you can see people just saying, okay, based on this, no, just this art picture, derive another one. Yes. So there is like giving mm. back to the initial author and you can see how much of art is influenced. In, in, in the music sense, you would see food samples of someone and you can see, okay, what is, this sounds familiar. Like, what sample by this? So oh, it's that's just so cool. One connection to take a look at the graph. Yeah, you could track the etymology of anything. Yeah. That's exactly. You know, the AI space, the AI blockchain mm -hmm. intersection is is getting a little crowded. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a lot of projects rebranding into AI and whatnot. When you look at the landscape, especially maybe you have some popular ones in your eyes. What are other projects missing? What are they not getting about trying to solve the AI problem using blockchain that you think that that you guys are on track with? Well, I, th I see a lot of interesting stuff happening and yeah. I wouldn't say that like we would be the definite judge judges of, course, of what, no. they, what they're missing but yeah what I what I think and it's essentially core DNA of ours is that there's a lot of projects trying to be the new chat GPT but decentralized the, we're gonna fight I don't know this these big guys and we're gonna be the better uh -huh. version of them and, mm. and I, I see the point there and it's it's not that it's invalid but what I what I feel is actually like the world is gonna evolve both in Web3 sense and outside of Web3. And the more we manage to synergize these technologies, the better. So the knowledge graph, the DKG, is actually designed to encapsulate that vision. That's why we presented this paper mm. on the verifiable internet, where mm -hmm. both centralized AI can work together with decentralized systems in a good way. And the good way to do this is to apply the principles that we, we mentioned. So in our case, feed AI trusted knowledge. Sure. And then use it whatever fashion you want, decentralized, centralized up to you. Uh, as long as we can create this crowdsourced knowledge base, the biggest human knowledge base in, in the world. Yeah. That's that's why we, we think uh, other projects might still not be going in that direction because mm -hmm. they're trying to like be the decentralized chat GPT rather. Yeah. yeah. We try to be the decentralized knowledge base mm. that feeds all of that and actually benefits from this synergy of symbolic and neural AI, which is the, the next wave of AI in a way. 
It's kind of a crazy story. Uh, you guys started in 2023, and then blockchain comes along. Okay, we'll we'll incorporate that. AI heats up. Okay, yeah. Now we have a, you know, a way here. Because the technology is so synergistic, this knowledge graph yeah. is is designed for connectivity. Yeah. And we can talk about philosophical about connectivity a lot. Sure. Like the godfather of connectivity is our advisor, Dr. Bob Bob Metcalf. Yeah. Is by the way running a node on Origin Trail. Uh, he's got see, his own node. He's got his own node. Yeah, you can check it out. You, <laughs> you can, can go and stake on his you node. Can you can stake on him track. now. What's exactly. it called? What's it called? It's called Metcalf Hook'em Horns. Hook'em uh, Horns. Hook, Hook'em Horns. Hook'em yeah. Horns. Yeah, it's like nice. the, this symbol for UT Austin. I think. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah, and I mean, um, just connectivity is this yeah. almost the closest thing to magic you could call something that's still kind of a technical term. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the law is called Metcalf's Law, and, mm -hmm. and basically a lot of people use it to make predictions about value for Bitcoin and other tokens. Yeah. But actually it's proven on the sense of social networks or generally traditional networks like phone networks, which makes sense essentially. The more phones you have in the world, the more connections you can make, the sure. more valuable it is, the more people can call to each other. Um, and same goes to social networks. I, I even feel like my own experience as a human, I'm just walking around inferring I don't know, knowledge from connections I'm making around me, right? Like I'm kind of like this hallucination myself of connections, <laughs> exactly. you know what I mean? Well, it's it's called emergence. Emergence. And that's a very interesting concept to look into. Okay. Yeah. Emergence is a um, property of the universe. Yeah. That when you connect two previously disconnected things, yeah. you get something new that wasn't there before. Wow. New knowledge, new... Think of hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. Two gases, they connect together. You get a liquid, which is water, which is the basis of our life. It happens on a physical level. It happens on an information level. Ab absolutely. Wow. Yeah. 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 So... All of, all of what we're doing here in Polkadot is in a way a synergy of different ideas. And because of this synergy, because of this connectivity, the ecosystem is stronger. You've definitely ignited the imaginations of a vibrant community. The Origin Trail community, the people who've been following you maybe for years, maybe yeah. for a decade. Wow, yeah. They're some of the most lit up people in the space, I think. <laughs> Super creative. Well, they're, they're kind of grounded in truth, kind of grounded in reality, you know, not off in the, uh, the hype sphere. <laughs> of, uh, of other projects. What's your perception of the community and how would you recommend other people get more involved? Yeah, definitely join our Discord or Telegram. Discord, uh, okay. D D Discord and Telegram have recently been revamped, so they're kind of in a nicer place now. Nice. But yeah, I mean, the community has been a really great supporter. They yeah. help us a ton and they just really are, are an inspiration many of the times. So shout out to everybody from, from the Tracer community. And um, yeah, like people have been, yeah, like you said, many, many years behind us uh, supporting the project, both in terms of evangelizing, contributing codes, creating knowledge, uh, building projects. Creating music. Creating music, <laughs> yeah. We have uh, five yeah. or six rap songs about Origin Trail. I know. Do you got a DKG? Do you got a DKG? Yeah. It's, it's, it's an unofficial anthem. Of <laughs> yeah, the, oh, the dude. Ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really good. Really good. Shout cool, out guys. to Amos and everybody. So Discord, uh, you got to read that white paper. It's 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 twelve pages or so. It's it's yeah. it's consumable. It's yeah. nice, yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't cool. be too hard. I hope. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we try to stay high level. <laughs> Good stuff. And uh, also open for feedback. It's pre-publication white exactly. like paper, so yeah. Any how to improve readability or add something new to it, yeah. Or criticisms or feedback, we'd love to learn because this is this is not us. Sure. And, you know, this is all of us together building. Crowdsource the knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Crowdsourcing. <laughs> It's amazing stuff, guys. Nicola Brana, and we really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing the story with us. Thanks and uh, hopefully we can see uh, more people in the, getting involved, more paranets, and uh, another successful decade of Origin Trail. Thanks a lot, brother.